high energy particles and accelerators. In this first elementary particle physics video, we will study how particle accelerators work and why physicists need them to study elementary particles. Thanks in advance for watching this video. If you liked this video, don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel and activate the bell. It is very important for the continuity of this channel. Let's start by defining what elementary particles are. Particles are called elementary particles if they have no internal structure. That is, they are not made out of any smaller constituents. The idea that the world is made of fundamental particles has a long history. In about 400 BC, the Greek philosopher Democritus suggested that matter is made of indivisible particles that he called atoms. This idea lay dormant until about 1904, when the English scientist John Dalton discovered that many chemical phenomena could be explained if atoms of each element were the basic indivisible building blocks of matter. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, it became clear that atoms are not indivisible. The discovery of the electron, the proton and the neutron seemed to complete the structure of the atom. It was accepted that all atoms could be considered to be made up of neutrons, protons and electrons. The basic constituents of the universe were no longer considered to be atoms, but rather protons, neutrons and electrons. Hence, the proton, the neutron and the electron are the building blocks of atoms. One might think that would be the end of the story. On the contrary, it is barely the beginning. In the 1930s, physicists started to discover a range of new subatomic particles, such as the positron and the muon, primarily as the result of experiments on high-energy cosmic radiation from space. So physicists concluded that if the incoming particle in a nuclear reaction has sufficient energy, new types of particles can be produced. A strong interest in uncovering these particles led scientists to develop high-energy particle accelerators in a laboratory setting. You might be wondering now, but why do we need high energy? First, by accelerating the particles to very high speeds, they give the particles enough energy to overcome the electric repulsive forces that might exist between the two objects, and this allows the two colliding objects to combine. Second, when using particles as a probe, we need to use particles with short wavelength to get detailed information about small things such as the interior of nuclei or other particles they strike. The wavelength of particles is given by de Broglie's wavelength formula. The greater the momentum of the bombarding particle, the shorter its wavelength. Third, many of the elementary particles are extremely massive, and the energy required to create them is correspondingly large. So new particles of greater mass can be produced at higher collision energies, transforming the kinetic energy of the colliding particles into massive particles by Einstein's equation. Before continuing, let us establish the units used in high energy physics. The basic units in physics are length, mass and time. And the international system of units expresses these in meters, kilograms, and seconds, and other quantities are derived, for example, velocity, energy, and momentum. Such units are not really convenient for particle physics, where typical lengths 
are on the order of the size of nuclei and typical masses are on the order of the mass of the proton. The commonly used units in high energy physics are given in the table below. Let's solve one example now. The order of the size of nuclei is about one Fermi. What does the total energy that a beam of electrons should have to be scattered by the target nuclei? For calculating the total energy of the electron, we use the formula. But we need to find out the momentum P. In order to resolve a particular of the size of nuclei, the de Broglie wavelength of the probe particle used to scatter from it must be of the same order of magnitude as the size of nuclei. So, to find out the momentum P, we use the de Broglie wavelength formula. We now substitute the values into the formula for the total energy. We can ignore the second term on the right hand side because it is much smaller than the first term. We use the table above to write the answer that will be given in high energy units. The total energy is 1.242 GeV. This is very high energy and it means that the de Broglie wavelength of these electrons is small enough to resolve particles inside the proton. In effect, the electrons can diffract off quarks inside the protons. The rest energy of the electron is much smaller than this energy. This is why we can ignore the second term in the equation for total energy. And we must be dealing with highly relativistic electrons. Both electric and magnetic fields play a key role in accelerators. So before looking at accelerators, let's remember the basics about the movement of charged particles in the electric and magnetic fields. A particle accelerator is pretty much exactly what it sounds like. A particle accelerator is a machine that accelerates beams of charged particles such as electrons, protons and ions to very high energies. To accelerate an object, as stated in Newton's second law, we must apply a force on it. Since we can physically push an object like a proton or electron, the best way to accelerate a charged particle is to use electric force. All accelerators employ electric fields to accelerate charged particles. For an electric field, the electric force is given by. And the work is given as follows. Suppose a negatively charged particle is moving in the plane of the screen and it is entering a magnetic field perpendicular to the screen represented by the small axis, like tails of arrows. The direction of the magnetic force is given by the left-hand rule. Since the particle is moving at right angles to the magnetic field, then the magnetic force is perpendicular to the direction of the velocity and this particle follows a curved path until it forms a complete circle. The magnetic force does no work on the particle because it is always perpendicular to the velocity. The magnetic force supplies the centripetal force to the particle. 
we can conclude that the magnetic field changes only the direction of charged particles and not their kinetic energies. If you want to remember a little more about electric and magnetic fields, I recommend that you watch the two videos that appear in the upper right corner of the video. Now, let's look at particle accelerators. There are two kinds of particle accelerators, linear and circular. Let's see how the linear accelerators work. A linear accelerator, LINAC, is a device that accelerates charged particles, which are usually electrons, protons, and ions. Basically, it consists of a series of hollow tubes within a long pipe-shaped vacuum chamber. The hollow tubes are called drift tubes, and they are connected to a source of high-frequency alternating voltage. When the first tube has a positive potential, the electron is accelerated into it. There is no electric field within the tube, so the electron moves at a constant velocity. The voltage applied to the tubes is alternating so that when the electron reaches a gap, the tube in front of it is positive and the one it just left is negative. The resulting electric field in the gap between the tubes accelerates the electron into the next tube, and this process continues, with the electron receiving an acceleration between each pair of tubes until the electron reaches the end to collide with the target. As the electron enters a drift tube, it travels with a ve constant velocity. At the gaps, the electron is accelerated, and this is why the tubes have to be progressively longer in size. A similar method is used to accelerate protons. Let's see how we could calculate the length of the first drift tube in a linear accelerator. Knowing that work equals charge times potential difference, then making velocity the subject of the equation, we get the velocity. We know the frequency, then making period the subject of the equation, we get the time that a particle is in each tube can be calculated by taking half the period of the alternating potential difference. As the electrons enter a drift tube, they travel with a constant velocity. So, to calculate the length of the drift tube, we multiply the time that a particle is in the drift tube by velocity. The cyclotron was the first type of circular particle accelerator and the first to achieve high energies. Cyclotrons accelerated particles in a spiral pattern, starting at their center. A cyclotron consists of two hollow semicircular electrodes, called the D's, mounted back to back, separated by a narrow gap in an evacuated chamber between the poles of a magnet. An electric field alternating in polarity is created in the gap by a radio frequency oscillator. The particles move around in a spiral shaped path. The force which keeps them moving this way is provided by a static magnetic field. The magnetic force supplies the centripetal force that causes circular motion. Each time they pass into the gap between the D's, an alternating electric field speeds them up the same way as in the linear accelerator. That is, the particles speed up only when they are in the gap between the D's. When the particles are within the D's, their radius and speed are related as follows. A particle is injected into the first D sector near the center of the cyclotron, 
and it moves in a circular path according to the equations we just derived. The time taken for this particle to move through this D is the same time taken by the particle in describing a semi-circle. Therefore, from these equations we can see that the time to travel around a D is constant for a constant magnetic field intensity and that the time is independent of the velocity and the radius. The time required for a complete revolution is the period and it can be calculated by multiplying the time taken for this particle to move through this D by 2. The frequency is given by the reciprocal of the period. There are two voltage changes per period of the driving voltage, just the same as there are two half turns per revolution of the particle. Therefore, the period of the driving voltage matches that of the particle, so the frequencies must also match. This is known as the cyclotron frequency. The synchrotron. The synchrotron has a ring of magnets and accelerating tubes through which the particles travel. The particles move in a circle of fixed radius, which can be very large. The larger the radius, the greater the kinetic energy of the particles can be for a given magnetic field strength. Large synchrotrons use a narrow ring of magnets with each magnet placed at the same radius from the center of the circle. The magnets are interrupted by gaps where high voltage accelerates the particle to higher speeds. The next two examples are solved step by step. If you have any questions, feel free to ask or suggest something.